Such a joyful, busy place. <laughs> he can stay and help me preach. <laughs> uh, hey, I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19 is where we're going to be kicking off today. We are still in our Just Jesus series, and, uh, but we are going to be kind of shifting into uh, heading into Easter. So for the next couple of months, we're going to be looking at Luke 19 through the end of the, the book and looking at Jesus' journey towards the cross and the resurrection and all that is wrapped up in that. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that is fine. Grab one of the pew Bibles around you. They look amazingly like this one. And uh, turn to page 1117, and you will be able to follow along in the Bible with us as we look at Luke chapter 19. Again, that was page 1117. Hey, have you ever had one of those days? I, just Friday, I love that. Uh, I'm not talking about one of those days where everything goes wrong. You know, just from as soon as you get up and until you go to bed. I'm not talking about one of those days where you're so busy you don't have any time to come up for air. You know, because those happen, you just finish the day and you just are so exhausted you fall into bed. I'm talking about one of those days where it's, it's like an emotional roller coaster. You've got the highs, you've got the lows, you've got everything in between. And, and it, by the end of the day, you just are emotionally spent. You ever had one of those days? Okay, well we, well, we all have, and um, a few years ago, uh, it was really, it was one of those days, it was one of those weekends, uh, but I had, uh, this is how my weekend went, I had a passion play practice on Saturday morning, a funeral that was kind of a, a tragic situation on Saturday afternoon, uh, services uh, Saturday night, Sunday morning, three services, another funeral for a friend that had been in the church for like 20 years, and then uh, I then I got to do a wedding for a young lady that I had dedicated as a baby, had baptized as a child, and then, and, was at her, and then got to do her wedding. And at the end of that weekend, I just like collapsed. I was just like emotionally all over the place because I had gotten the joy of worship, the excitement of planning, the, the grief of you know, just sharing in that sorrow with friends, and then just the sweetness of uh, celebrating a wedding. And I was just done. And today we're looking at one of those days in the life of Jesus. And, and I want you to see it from the perspective of one of those days because it allows us to understand that, that Jesus really does get what we go through. He understands all of the aspects of our life. And, and our story picks up uh, in Luke chapter 19 uh, on a day that is traditionally called Palm Sunday. It's a week before the resurrection, and everybody is heading to Jerusalem. And so the first thing we're going to talk about is the celebration. The celebration. Traditionally, uh, if you grew up in around church, you know what happens on Palm Sunday. That's the day that Jesus enters into Jerusalem, what is often called the triumphal entry. And, and we tend to think of it as a one-dimensional kind of day, but I want you to see this day was filled with all kinds of different emotions for Jesus. Uh, but it starts off with celebration. So let's look at the scripture. Before we read the, the text, so let me set the scene for you a little bit. It's Passover. Passover is the biggest holiday of the year, and Jews from all over the world and all over the nation are coming to Jerusalem. Jesus is in that throng of people with his 12 disciples. They are going to Jerusalem, and he's told the disciples, I'm going there to die. They're going to hand me over to evil men, uh, and I'm going to be crucified and rise from the dead. The disciples have tried to talk him out of going to Jerusalem. They don't want that to happen, so they're opposed to it. But Jesus says, we're going to go anyway. And so they're heading there, and Jesus knows it's his last uh, entrance into Jerusalem. Um, now, the story gets a little bit weird because he sends a couple of disciples ahead to go get a donkey. Actually, like a, a colt of a donkey. So a baby donkey that, uh, not like baby baby, but, you know, he could ride on it. And, and, and he says, hey, go into the town ahead of us. Uh, you'll find a donkey tied up. Untie it and bring it to me. And the disciples are like, okay, before we steal the donkey... Uh, what if the people don't want us to take the donkey? He said, just tell them the Lord has need of it, and it'll be good. And they're like, okay. And they go, and they get it. And the people ask, what are you doing with the donkey? The Lord has need of it, and they bless him. And that's where our story picks up. Verse 35 of Luke 19. It says, and they brought it to Jesus, 
And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives. By, by the way, visual. Uh, Jesus had, had come through Jericho, Bethany. He came up the Mount of Olives. And as he crested the Mount of Olives, all of Jerusalem is laying out in front of him. And he's looking specifically right down on the Temple Mount. He can see the temple. He can see the gate called the Golden Gate that he's going to go in through. He's going to pass down through the Garden of Gethsemane and up and into the city. So as he's uh, drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. And they said, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The day was a celebration, at least this part of it. And Jesus' followers praised him for who he is and what he's done. His followers praised him for who he is and what he's done. Now, think about this. Jesus is riding into Jerusalem through the midst of the crowds. Now, everybody from Galilee that is coming to Jerusalem for Passover is traveling the same route as Jesus. And there's a lot of people, not just the 12 who are with him, who have seen what he's done. Hundreds, possibly thousands of people are in this throng of people coming from Galilee. And maybe they were in the crowd when he fed the 5,000 with the loaves and the fish. Maybe they were there when he cast the demon out of somebody. Maybe he healed their relative or, you know, it was their grandfather that was blind. In any case, they began to shout praises to Jesus. And, and they started saying, blessed is he, who, the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And they lay their cloaks down in the road for the donkey to pass over. In other words, they began to treat Jesus like like a king, like royalty. They're honoring him. They're respecting him because they want Jesus to be the Messiah. Now, in their minds, the Messiah was the king who would come into Jerusalem, would lead a revolt against Rome and establish, again, a godly kingdom in Jerusalem. Well, see, they know he's legit because they've seen the mighty works. That's why they're praising him. That's why they're shouting out and celebrating now, the Pharisees, the religious leaders who were probably traveling with them from Galilee, who had been, you know, kind of bantering back and forth with Jesus, challenging him, not liking him all this time, they kind of come up to him and say, Jesus, you need to tell these disciples to stop saying this because that's inappropriate. They're calling you the Messiah. They, they're going to start something that you don't want to finish. And Jesus looks at them and says, no. I'm not going to tell them to stop because if they are silent, the rocks will cry out. If they don't praise me, then creation will declare my majesty, my glory. See, if you think about it, the presence of God demands our praise. Doesn't it? When you encounter the living God, when you come to recognize who Jesus is, that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, that, that he died on the cross for your sins and was raised from the dead, that there's none other like him, that he is your king and he is your Lord, then the most natural thing you can do is praise him. Celebrate him. Lift up your voice to, to honor him and, and recognize him as king. You see, when we experience his life-changing power, it is natural for us to express our joy and our celebration and our thanksgiving in worship. That's what we do here, isn't it, in worship? That's what you just did? You know, the singing, the clapping, the raising hands. I know, some of you are even dancing. You don't have to tell us because we're in the back, we can see you. You know, I know, you, the lights are down, you're kind of feeling free. Some of you just do that little bit of pew dancing, you know, right there. You're just kind of keeping it right here. But others of you are cutting loose. <laughs> Don't worry, we're, it, we're fine with that. God's fine with that. We're all good. That's why we do what we do in worship. But honestly, it's easy to praise God here, isn't it? 
It's easy to praise God when you're in the crowd, when everybody else is doing it. It was easy for the crowd to praise Jesus on that day too. But that was before he was targeted and arrested and executed. You know, sometimes it's tempting to have a bandwagon faith, isn't it? It's kind of what's cool. Your friends are doing it. You just kind of join along with the crowd, and it's easy to praise Jesus with the crowd. But do you ever initiate the praise, or do you just follow the lead of others? Um, You see, hopefully our praise flows out of that life-changing relationship with Jesus, a a relationship that is an everyday, seven-day-a-week living relationship in your life. So I ask you this morning, is praising Jesus a normal part of life or is it a special event? Think about this. Maybe wrestle with this. Maybe talk about this in your life groups. Do you thank God when you wake up in the morning and when you go to bed at night? Do you praise God for his love and mercy towards you? That he would love you enough to sacrifice his son for you? That he's forgiven you of all your sins and and, and given you life eternal. Do you you thank him for that spontaneously, naturally, at any point during the day? When you see the sunrise or the sunset and and just all of its beauty and glory, do do you stop to lift up just thanksgiving to God for that? Or do you just post it on Facebook to taunt your friends up north? Uh, It's okay to do both, but I just was wondering if you included the praise. Do you celebrate the majesty of God when you look at your children or your grandchildren and see just in the wonder how God has formed them with those tiny fingers and toes and, and just how perfect they are? Hey, when you're in the car, do you sing songs of praise, of joy, whether the radio's playing or not? Do you lead your family to worship? Do you read your Bible? Do you pray in your home? You see, the celebration flows out of us when we recognize who Jesus is and what he has done, especially in us. Is celebration part of your normal life? Jesus today started off with celebration, triumphal entry, and then it changed and it turned to sorrow. Let's talk about the sorrow. Verses 41 through 44, Jesus is still not yet to Jerusalem. He's on the way. It's part of the triumphal entry. And while he's surrounded by people who are praising him and who are shouting, this is what he experiences. Verse 41, it says, And when Jesus drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, Jerusalem, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children with you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. The sorrow. Jesus grieved because the people missed him. They missed him. The people that he loved, that he created, that he called to be his own people, missed him. They didn't know him. They didn't understand him. They didn't care about what he'd done. Yeah, there were multitudes around him that had come with him from Galilee, maybe that had seen some of the miracles that he'd worked, and and they were celebrating. But the most of the people in the city, the religious leaders, all of them just didn't care who Jesus was. They were living unaware that God was in their midst. That's what Jesus says. If they'd only known about your visitation, your visitation, that God in the flesh, the God who they worshiped, the God they were gathering for Passover to celebrate, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who formed the nation of Israel, the God who'd led them out of slavery in Egypt through the plagues and through the sea, the God who'd given them the Ten Commandments, the the God who'd given them a promised land and raised up King David and they built a temple for, the God who'd called out prophets that they read and studied was standing in their midst and they didn't know it. Unaware. And Jesus wept 
He grieved. Why did he grieve? He grieved because of the prophecy of destruction. Did you catch that? As he talks about not one stone will be left upon another. You'll be surrounded and hemmed in and ripped apart, you and your children. Jesus is prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem, which takes place in 70 A.D. See, the, the Jews didn't understand what made for peace. They didn't understand that God's kingdom was not of this world. And so they continued to rebel against Rome. They tried to be their own independent nation. And so in 68 AD, the the Roman general Titus brought three legions to to Israel. And they besieged Jerusalem. They started in 68 AD. Two years later, 70 AD, Jerusalem fell. They killed everybody who was in the city. They tore the city apart. They broke down the walls. They destroyed the temple. Uh, they, They just leveled the city. They even spread salt on the ground because they didn't want anybody to be there ever again. Jesus wept for that destruction, for that pain that his city was going to experience. And he wept because they were living in darkness. There he is, the light of the world, and he knows they're living in darkness. And see, Jesus wept because he wants people to have life and hope and freedom, and they missed it. And in his sorrow, Jesus demonstrated the attitude that his followers are to have toward people who don't know God. I don't want you to miss this, just like they miss Jesus. But he set an example for us. And and this is crucial to us because we live in a world that increasingly is hostile toward Jesus and his church, right? Do you you catch that? Do you read the news? Do you follow things on the internet? Do you listen to people talk? Do, Do you understand what's out there in the social media? Things have changed these last 50 years dramatically. And we're living in the midst of that. I mean, followers of Christ are identified as being, at best, ignorant, and at worst, hate-filled bigots. If if you watch movies or television, then Christianity is regularly ridiculed, and people of faith are are identified as being hypocrites or just corrupt. And I don't know about you, but that irritates me. You guys with me on that? Does it bother anybody else when you're watching TV and they make another joke about the church? Or about believers. If people post stuff or say things and, you know, and, and, and here's the thing. The temptation for us is to get angry. We want to get angry. We want to defend our faith and ourselves. We want to lash out at the people who insult us and who attack our faith. We want to show them something. That's a temptation. But we're followers of Jesus. We're followers of Christ. Do you know what Jesus said as part of the Beatitudes? Beatitudes are Matthew chapter 5, the the first part. I'd encourage you to go home and read this, uh, talk about it in your life group a little bit. This This is what Jesus said at the end of that, verses 11 and 12. He said, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Um, Did you hear what he said? He said, blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Can I just tell you something? I don't feel really blessed when they do that. Anybody with me on that? No, I told you, I already feel anger. I feel irritated in my soul. And and yet Jesus is saying, hey, um, you're blessed when that happens. So here's this dynamic that's going on. You know, if you're a person of faith, I just want you to understand the struggle that's happening within us. See, because we we feel that, that, you know, anger, that tension, whatever, you know, we want to respond. And Jesus is saying, hey, you're, you're blessed when that happens. And yet I pray for God to bless me. And I pray for God to bless you. Do you guys want God to bless you? Yeah, we do, don't we? We want God to bless us. And here's the thing. God is blessing us, and we don't like it. Isn't he? I mean, we're living in a culture, in a world that is increasingly antagonistic toward Christianity, verbally and and sometimes legally, and, and we get irritated, and Jesus says, hey, guys, I don't want you to get angry. I want you to rejoice and be glad. I'm not feeling all that joy and gladness when that's happening. You know what that means? That means that my attitude is wrong. 
And as a follower of Christ, I need to have his attitude because scripture tells us have the same attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. But not only did Jesus teach that, but Jesus demonstrated it in this passage. He wept over Jerusalem. He wept because they were lost and he came to find them. And some of them would be found, but others would perish, never knowing forgiveness and hope. And that breaks the heart of God still. So today, is your attitude toward the unchurched one of compassion or anger? Now, See, that's a tricky question because sometimes it's really easy to be compassionate when somebody's right in front of us. And then to be angry toward the crowds that we don't know, and yet God has sent us to express his love to them. So is your attitude toward the unchurched one of compassion or anger? Are they receiving your love or your scorn? And it, it begins at home. Are the, the unbelieving members of your family, are they receiving your love or your scorn? How about the people you work with? How about out in public? Oh, wait, how about at social media? Hey, can I tell you guys something? This is kind of a life thing, so you know, hear it for what it's worth, because some of you need to know this. Just because you read something on social media that you actually agree with does not mean that you are required to like it or share it. <laughs> do, you, do you know what I'm saying? Because here's what happens. Some people post stuff on social media that, that pretty much expresses that anger towards those who don't believe. And we're like, yeah, I feel that. But when we share it, when we like it, when it's out there as what we feel, what we're saying to the people that are our mission field is that we're mad at you. We don't like you. And yet our mission as the church is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. And if you're angry on Facebook all the time, how are you going to tell people that Jesus loves them? It's kind of like saying, hey, I want to tell you some really good news, but first I want to hit your hand with a hammer. Boom. <laughs> now let me tell you how Jesus loves you. You hit my hand with a hammer, I don't care what you have to say. I just want to hurt you back. I'm going to get a bigger hammer. You see, it's so tempting and so easy to express our disdain and our contempt for those who do not share our faith. But if you do this, you are not following Jesus. See, Jesus, his heart was grieved that people rejected him and his mercy. Honestly, do you grieve for those who are missing Jesus? Or are you angry at those who are missing Jesus? Or are you just apathetic? about your family, your friends, your coworkers, knowing that they're going to spend eternity in hell. You see, we're followers of Jesus. We want to represent Jesus to this world. And by the way, that means we need to have the character of Jesus. Character is one of our core values here at Calvary. We believe that you cannot represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. That's why we need to see Jesus' sorrow and we need to enter into his sorrow. So Jesus was celebrated and he was sorrowful. And on this roller coaster emotional day, then Jesus got angry. Let's look at the indignation that Jesus expresses. Verse 45 and 46. Now, again, he's just continuing down the Mount of Olives. He's paused there outside the wall of Jerusalem to grieve. And now he goes through the Golden Gate and right onto the Temple Mount. It says, as Jesus entered the temple, and be he began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Now, when you read Matthew and Mark, uh, they get a little more detailed. Jesus grabbed a whip. And he started driving the animals out and he flipped over tables and he completely and totally wrecked their day that were doing the money changing and the selling of things in the temple. He just totally upset the whole apple cart of what was going on in the temple because he was angry. 
You see, Jesus was angry at those who were misrepresenting God. Uh, now, first, some of you are shocked that Jesus got angry. So let me just be really clear. Uh, anger is not a sin. Anger, a lot of times, leads to sin, but feeling angry isn't a sin. In fact, the Bible, Ephesians 4, 26, the Apostle Paul says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. Be angry, yet do not sin. Feeling angry isn't a sin. Being destructive is a sin, whether you're angry or not. Acting on your anger to hurt people is always wrong. Feeling angry isn't. Jesus was angry. And by the way, God's wrath is real. Uh, do you know what God's wrath actually is? God's wrath is justice that is expressed outwardly. You see, in the end, when Jesus ends this world as we know it, we get new bodies, new life, new heaven, new earth, there's going to be a time of judgment where justice prevails and all the wrongs of the world will be brought into right. And a lot of times we look back and we want justice for other people, Right? We, we want some people to experience the wrath of God. Here's the thing. We don't want justice for ourselves. If you think you want justice for you, you are so wrong. Because here's the reality. Because of sin, because all of us are sinners, all of us deserve to burn. We all deserve death. We all deserve hell. That's what we've earned the right for. So when somebody says, I want justice, I'm like, I don't want justice. I want mercy. <laughs> See, God sent Jesus into this world to pay for our sins so that we could receive mercy, so that we could be forgiven. That's grace. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. We just get it. That's why Jesus' heart was broken, because he wanted people to have mercy. But Jesus was angry, and God's wrath is real. And in that moment, in that day, Jesus unleashed the wrath of God at the religious leaders because they had prostituted God's temple. Uh, let me try to set this scenario for you because this makes a whole lot more sense when you, when you understand it. It's Passover, so Jews from all over the world are coming to the temple to worship God, to celebrate Passover. Now, when they come to the temple... They need to do two things. They need to pay a temple tax and they need to sacrifice an animal. Okay, that was all part of the worship that they had. You know, they did animal sacrifices at the temple. And, and the priests were supposed to represent God to the people, saying, okay, we're, get, we're representing the nature and character of God so that we'll take your money, we'll take your sacrifices, and we'll use them to glorify God. But here's what was happening. People would come, and they were traveling from all over the world, and they would bring the money from wherever they lived, and they would bring it to the temple, and the temple said, we only take Judean money. Any of you guys ever travel and have to exchange money? Yeah. You know what? That's a lose scenario. <laughs> you show up at dollars, you buy the local currency, they charge you for it. You want to exchange the local currency back into dollars, they charge you for it. You lose coming and going. Well, they were doing that at the temple, only they were giving them a really, really bad exchange rate. So basically, you're taking your money, and you were exchanging it for their money, and then when you got their money back, and you had less of it than you started with, then you gave them their money. That's wrong. They're ripping people off. It didn't stop there. It talked about the animal sacrifice. See, you're supposed to bring a clean animal to be sacrificed, whether that's birds, whether that's a goat, whether that's lambs. Uh, and you got to bring it, and the priests have to say it's okay. Well, most people are not going to try and bring their animal when they're traveling hundreds of miles. You know, right? You really want to bring a goat from Egypt, you know, when you got no planes, trains, or automobiles? I mean, bringing the kids is bad enough, right? <laughs> so they don't bring their own goat. They, they go there, and they say, okay, i got to buy me a temple animal. It's already been approved by the priest, so you know that it's, it's good, and, and so you can sacrifice it. But again, they're charging, you know, double, triple, four times what it's worth for you to be able to sacrifice that animal. It's kind of like when you buy a, a Coke at Disneyland. <laughs> Is there anybody here who feels good about buying a Coke at Disneyland? I mean, we want to go to Disneyland. We, well, we don't want to. We want to take our kids to Disneyland and our grandkids to Disneyland. But, you know, when you drop four or five dollars for a Coke, it's, you know, it just disturbs the soul. Right? And I drink a lot, all right? I'm just confessing. You think, oh, I'll go be cheap and get a bottle of water, four bucks. You know, that's, it's like you can buy two cases for that back home. 
Well, that's what they were doing to the worshipers who came to honor God and to celebrate his goodness. So the priests were supposed to be helping people know and worship God, and instead they were gouging people who wanted to worship him. They profaned God's name and they profited off of God's people, and that made Jesus angry. I want you to know this. God isn't angry at your failures, your mistakes, your mess-ups. He grieves the pain that sin causes you. Do you get that? He grieves the pain. That's why he died to redeem your pain, redeem your life from sin. It breaks his heart. He wants to bless you and lead you to life. But God is angry when those who profess to follow him misrepresent him to the world. When we who bear his name represent him poorly to the world, I think that's what irritates him. That's what sets him off. Whether that is profiting off of sincere worshipers like some ministries and some televangelists do, or whether that is calling your business a Christian business, And then doing substandard work or charging people too much money because they trust you? Or whether that's a pastor who's always asking for free stuff. There's a lot of pastors who are always looking for that pastoral discount. And I'm like, why should we get a discount? God's already blessed us. By the way, there's a lot of people who bless me. And there's a difference between receiving a blessing and expecting it. Just one of my pet peeves. Or maybe it's just living a life of practiced hypocrisy. Where you wear the label proudly, but you have no intention of trying to honor God with what you do, with what you say, with how you work, with how you treat your family. You see, I think when we intentionally misrepresent God's values and his truth and his kingdom, I think that's when he gets angry. So I want to close uh, with a question. Just imagine that Jesus showed up in your life tomorrow. What tables would Jesus overturn in your life? What ways might you be misrepresenting his love and his grace and his mercy? Will you pray with me? Father, we're broken and yet you love us. We rebel and yet you call us to be your sons and daughters. And today, we just want to thank you for your grace and your mercy. We want to praise you for how you have loved us and how you've worked miracles in our lives and how you have called us to be sons and daughters of God. We confess that we don't praise you enough. And Father, we pray today that you would break our hearts for our friends and our family members and our neighbors who don't know you. And God, that you would call us to live as people of integrity who really can represent Jesus to this world. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you never give up on us. Thank you that you're always calling us to deeper waters, to live differently, to a new life, to to serve you more. Today, I pray that we'd hear your voice even as we continue to lift up praises to your name. It's in the name of Jesus we ask this. Amen. Let's stand together and let's continue to worship our God.